All right, today's topic is a really uh, a really um, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to say this and then ask a question if it's confusing. Well, let me let me do this first. Uh, I believe if you can begin to grasp what we're going to go through today, you could teach any block of scripture to anyone with very little prep. Um, the more prep you get in, the better, right? The more opportunity you have to dive into scriptures, the better. But oftentimes, you're just not going to have all the time that you want to have, right? To prepare a seminary lesson. And so understanding the structure of what we're trying to accomplish in any class would really help you to take a random block of scripture and say, well, I know what the end result is supposed to be here. And so knowing that we can get there together as a team, the students, you, the Holy ghost. Um, so this is a very structural, what is seminaries and institutes trying to do with the scriptures today? I'm going to talk quite a bit, and then we're going to try to practice it together. Um, so I'd encourage you to, to write things down, to stop me and say, hey, could you clarify what you're saying here, what this is saying? Um, yeah, feel free to stop me anytime, but we're going to go through a handful of things and then try to practice it. Okay, everybody good so far? All right. So the official topic <laughs> is help learners discover and understand gospel doctrines and principles in a passage of scripture. In some ways, institutes, we teach the scripture sequentially. Um, there are other classes where it's done topically um, and institute, it's often topical, but, uh, in seminary, we go from beginning to the end and we follow, come follow me. And so we skip some things based off of summertime and spring breaks and other things. But for the most part, um, if I'm teaching first Nephi chapter one, I'm teaching from the beginning of first Nephi chapter one to the end of first Nephi chapter one. And so my job as a teacher is to help my students understand, discover first, and then understand gospel doctrines and principles in those, that sequential study of the scriptures. Um, by the way, I'm going to make my screen so that it's as big as it can be, and I'm not going to see you. So if you have something to say, just speak up, okay? Just, just speak up and I'll hear you. You'll have to unmute yourself to do so. So... Um, how, how do we do that? Well, it's called the teaching and learning pattern. And this is something you should memorize if you want to be able to jump into any block of scripture and, and handle it with a little less prep than maybe you would like. Um, so going through the teaching and learning pattern real quick, the first part is that we've got to help students and ourselves understand the context and the content of what's happening in that particular chapter of scripture. Once we've understood the content and context, we can begin to identify truths, which we call principles or doctrines. Um, once we start to see in the text what the truths are, the principles and doctrines, then it's our responsibility to understand those principles and doctrines, help students feel the truth and importance of those principles and doctrines, and then finally, to apply those principles and doctrines. And 100% of the curriculum is written to this pattern, okay? I'm gonna say that again. 100% um, of the curriculum is written to that, that pattern. So you could go into any seminary and institute manual and look at a line and, and then say, okay, what is this line trying to do within the realm of this pattern? And you'd say, oh, that line is trying to help students understand the principle. 
oh, this quote is trying to help students feel the truth and importance of the principle. Oh, there's a question, there's an apply question that they're trying to ask right there. And you probably have a better question in mind, but that's what they were attempting to do with that, that question. So knowing that the curriculum writers are utilizing this pattern will really help you because you can look in and say, okay, this is what I think they're trying to do. Um, I have a story that will actually, I'm going to plug in place of this idea, but I'm going to follow this sequence because my story is going to help students understand this principle from my own life. And then you can utilize your life, your personality, your gifts and talents within the realm of what the curriculum is trying to do with the teaching and learning pattern. Uh, any questions so far? All right, so today we're going to focus our time on these top two part of the pattern. Uh, I, I do want you to know there's more to the pattern, but for our time's sake, we're, we're really zeroed in on understand the content and context and identify the principle. I, I would argue passionately that you can't do the pattern well if you don't do these first two things because right understand what the principle that you've identified feel the truth and importance of that principle that you identified and apply that principle that you identified what happens sometimes with a lot of gospel teachers me included is we want to get so quickly to the application because that's what we're excited about you know, that's where the gospel really impacts our lives, that we get there too quickly and we start to ask questions to students like, you know, what does this mean for us today? And no one says anything. And we think, oh, man, my students don't talk. What, what is wrong with what's happening? My students will not respond to my questions. And what's actually happened is this teacher has not built the foundation to get to that question and so students don't respond. And so I would, I would also very passionately argue your students will talk even at 6 a.m. when the foundation of this pattern is laid well and they feel like it's relevant to them, they wanna talk about it. Okay, Once I'm very serious about it. If you have questions, please ask them. Um, so, so don't let me just keep going with, if you're stuck on something. All right. So those first two steps here, understanding the context and content of the scriptures and the words, the prophets prepares us, our team to recognize the message of the inspired authors, the context and content clarify and illustrate gospel doctrines and principles record recorded in the experiences and teachings of others so when we say the word context we're saying the passages of scriptures that proceed or follow a verse of or series of verses right if i'm going to teach third nephi 11 today it's important that learners understand what happened in the first 10 chapters of third nephi uh, otherwise 11 can still be powerful by itself but it would have more impact and depth when we've understood the context of what's going on here in third Nephi chapter 11. Right? Um, and second context is the circumstance that surround or give background to a passage event or story. It means to understand the, it, it, it's, it's a means to understand the content of the scriptures. The context provides background information that clarifies, brings depth of understanding to the stories, teachings, doctrines, and principles in the text, right? So context being historical information related to that time period of the passage. Okay, Another I've, got, I've got a question yes, for you. Yes. yes. Um, okay, so because of the way we're set up with come follow me, we're going to come back in in August somewhere in Proverbs. Yep. Having missed all of these great stories over the summer, like Daniel and Lion's Den sure. and Ruth and everybody. How much context are you going to recap? Or are you going to assume that their families actually did cover that material? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Yeah. The Old Testament 
um, uh, for example, when you get to Proverbs, there's not a ton of contextual information that's needed to understand Proverbs. Um, so I'm going to do as much as is necessary to give that rich experience to them. Daniel in the lion's den does not enhance Proverbs. It's a great story, <laughs> but it doesn't give me more context to Proverbs. I guess, um, then I'm, I guess then what I'm asking is, is, you know, every time we have this new movement or yeah. um, something else happens with the Israelites and so yeah. forth, and they continue to develop, um, they're developing, you know, kings and all of these different structures. Um, how much of that is necessary as we move into the rest of the Old Testament, you know, setting up the yeah. New Testament? It's a great question. I, I'd say a, a little bit, right? Probably as much as you could do in a couple of paragraphs. But this is a fun thing that this is good for everybody to know. I'm really glad you asked that question. Um Early on this August and September, the way Come Follow Me is set up, there are a lot of flex days. Yeah. A flex day is a day when the curriculum has like two actual lessons uh, that have been prepared for you from that week's Come Follow Me, but you have five days to teach those two lessons. And so that gives you three flex days. So you may utilize some of these early August, September flex days to go and do Daniel in the lion's den or to go back and do some of this summer stuff that you're excited about and would help provide great context to students. So that's what I would encourage everybody to do. And, and there's some pacing guides out there. If your coordinator hasn't sent you a pacing guide yet, I'd be happy to send you the pacing guide that I'm sending out to teachers um, I just finished it yesterday, actually. So if you want a, a good pacing guide, then put your, I'll share it in the chat at the end thank or, you. or you can give me your email. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's interesting because just what she said would almost be enough, you know, where we left off in the spring, this is where we were. And since that time, you know, we, we learned about Ruth and, uh, you know, and just giving that famous scripture, you know, I'll go where you go, I'll die where you die, blah, blah, blah. I mean, these are things that are familiar to most kids. Like we've all heard it from the time we were sunbeams, right? But then for her to just say, or for all of us to just say, then they set up their kings, you know, and yeah. they go through this process and Daniel in the lion's den comes into this story and you you remember that and I I think just those types of things like what you're talking about to prime the conversation to where you're going to get them to go in their brain which is to proverbs right where we are at is almost enough to say you 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 know this aren't these aren't the details but this is what we did and this is what we did and this is what we did and now here's where we are Thank you. That's a good comment. One and thing I think will help to recognize is that they've been going to Sunday school as well. And Sunday school has come follow me and covering a lot of that content. Yeah. Good. And, and for sure, if there's a particular lesson that going backwards is going to help, then, then do it, right? Go backwards and, and grab that. Um, and because our incoming freshmen have had none of the first semester. Of, of setup. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Okay. So this is another way I like to say this, and that's step into their world, right? And that's a good phrase to use with seminary students. Let's step into their world a little bit here as we try to understand um, the context of what's going on in whatever given block of scripture that you're in. Um, now the content is what's actually are the words, right? What, what is the storyline? Who's in the story? What events are happening here? Or this is the sermon that's given. This is the, the Proverbs little line of, of wisdom that, uh, it's inspired 
explanations that make up the scriptural text. The content gives the relevance, the life, and it also states often the doctrine and the principles. So coming to know the people described in the scriptures can help inspire, encourage us to meet the challenges that we face with faith, right? So we look at, at Nephi and we're inspired by the faith that Nephi has. That faith is demonstrated in the words of the page, and that's what we call the content, okay? So when we say context and content, we're talking about what the scriptures are offering to us, the passages of the scripture, and all of the background related to those, those words that are there. Now, one of the greatest challenges that we have as teachers is to know how much time to spend on context and content. If we go back to the teaching and learning pattern, which you now have memorized, the first part is understand the content and context. The rest of it has to do with the truths that the context and content offer us. Identify the principles, understand the principles, feel the truth and importance of the principles, and apply the principles. And so do we spend 45 minutes of our 50 in the context and content of the students and then leave five minutes for the rest of the teaching pattern? And I hope that you know the obvious, the obvious answer there is please don't do that. Um, but we want to give enough time that the conversation has meaning and that we're not being superficial and, and, and cherry picking verses, a cherry picking of verses saying, well, here's the whole chapter and I like this one verse. So let's just spend 50 minutes in that one verse. And so it's, it is a tough, it is a tough balance. So some thoughts on that. Um, this, this paragraph so that you're not just listening to me, Kim, would you read this? Paragraph, please. Yeah. Thanks. With all the information, well, I'm going to have to move you. Hold on. With all the information that could be learned and taught, teachers should use wisdom in determining how much actual time is devoted to context and content and how much time to spend studying the doctrine and principles of the gospel. Teachers could provide sufficient context and content to help students understand the eternal truths found in the scriptural text but not overemphasize such background and details to the degree that they become the core of the lesson. Any thoughts about that, Kim? Yeah, <laughs> a, a lot um, with what you were just saying that, you know, if we're trying to plan this lesson and we only have 50 minutes, it really could, I could see getting caught up in remember what was happening yesterday and so now this is where we are and and spending too much time on trying to help them I do think that some students will need a little more help than others in stepping into that world and trying to imagine what that was probably like and and the circumstances that would make people think or feel the way that is causing them to act in certain ways but um, that and it is foundational but it is not the meat yet you know it's it's just helping us get to where we need to be to understand the, the principle right and sometimes teachers ask well where do i go to find the the context well, where do i go to understand the background the the material that church has provided always gives a big a paragraph at this, the yes. top of each lesson that says you know remember here's what's going on um and so there's not a whole lot more that you need beyond that. Now, there's lots of resources out there. You can go find books written by lots of different individuals. And I'd, I'd say just, you know, you're, it's okay to look at those things and to go find other resources if, if you want to. But I'd just be careful not to do too much outside of what the curriculum offers for background. Now, it doesn't do all the background for sure. And you might have access and knowledge and study of the past that gives you some more context. And that's great. You can use it in class. But just the, the caution here is that we're not teaching historical lessons to students, right? We're not trying to help them understand dates and the history of, of how the kings went forth and who what their names are and, and what city they were in. Like, we don't care about those things as far as like testimony building. If it helps the the, let's draw more truths out and more principles, then great, let's utilize it. But if it's just information, 
we're not teaching a history class. So. Yeah, that could actually be a little more distracting than yeah. helpful. Good, Julie, you look like you have a question. I, I was saying, say, I think one of the things I appreciate about that paragraph, and sometimes there's a couple of them during the lesson, is that they help me in my thought process to de-emphasize something that maybe really is not significant, but takes 12 verses, you know? Yeah. Um, and and helps me to pick and choose where I am going to pull out more of that context. Beautiful. Really, really well said. And remember that you're often covering large blocks, blocks of scripture in the Old Testament anyway. And so to feel like I need to read every verse is definitely not a requirement. I, I might see a 12 verse part and I can summarize it in in 20 seconds and that's great and then we we focus in on the next verse where we're going to be pulling out truth from it but that background of those 12 verses you summarizing helped us gather some more truth out of the verse that you read together as a class all right one so thing, sorry can i say yeah. one one thing that i do like about content and context is um i feel like i try to use it as a way to to help the kids see how they are alike how they're similar to you know like when both Enoch and Moses were, um, you know, talked about being slow of speech, or, you know, I talk about feeling weak or feeling not up to the task. And, um, you know, kind of being able to put the kids, you know, I like the idea of step into their world and how they can kind of, I think the content and context, I agree that there's a ton of it that just, you know, yeah, it's like one or two sentences of here's where we are. But I do like using that to kind of go, okay, here's where we are and here's how they were feeling at the time and can kind of give the kids this idea that, that maybe these people that lived thousands and thousands of years ago aren't, even though they had some really different cultural um, circumstances in their lives, that they are still, that the human experience is still yeah. like what they felt is still what we feel. Absolutely. Likening the scriptures yeah. to ourselves. And I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm very pro context and content like that. I, I hope that that's very clear today. We've got to do, we got to understand the content and context, right? If we don't, then we're, we're missing the whole foundation of what we're trying to build in class. Okay. So continuing on here now to identify the principle. Uh, I'll read this one. Learning how to identify gospel doctrine principles found in the scriptures takes thoughtful effort and practice. That's really important to understand because I know so many teachers who get frustrated with students struggling with identifying principles. And so they, as the teacher, just want to do it for them. Um, it's not easy. It takes practice. In fact, I sit with professionals and we practice this. Like it, it's it's something I'm I'm working on after 17 years of doing this every day. Like this takes effort and time. So I just wanted to key in on that. As principles and doctrines are identified, it's important that they're clearly and simply stated. A knowledge, understanding, and testimony of the doctrine and principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ will provide students with direction and sufficient strength to make choices that are consistent with Heavenly Father's will. So let's, let's define what we're saying when we say doctrines and principles, okay? And this can be a hairy conversation, or we're not going to have a, a debate about whether this is a doctrine or whether it's actually a principle, like in fact, President Irene said that's a fruitless conversation. It um, totally is. They get but, used so interchangeably all yeah. the time. Yeah. But there, there is a, a subtle difference, and we'll try to define it here and then, and then move on. <laughs> a doctrine is a fundamental, unchanging truth. Such truths like Heavenly Father has a body of flesh and bones. Baptism is necessary in the kingdom of God all men will be resurrected. Those are examples of doctrine. A principle is an enduring truth or rule individuals can adopt to guide them in making decisions. So um, if I were stating this, I'd say a doctrine is a simple statement of truth that doesn't necessarily lend to application without creating a principle out of that doctrine. 
all principles should feed out of a doctrine and an eternal truth that's unchanging, but a, a, a principle is more application-y than a simple statement of God has a body of flesh and bone. Right? Um, Joy, are you raising your hand? Or is that from a previous? No, that's that's me. Um, I'm sorry I don't have video. I'm getting ready to go to a funeral. Um, I just wanted to to mention that, you know, in the I teach online seminary. So my students do a good amount of the individual modules. And one thing that I notice is that one of the questions is, you know, when they read a scripture, what principle can you identify in the scripture or what doctrine? And then in the very next screen, it will answer that question. And I think that a lot of my kids and I myself even tend to not ponder it myself very much, but to just move to the next screen and see what the lesson is telling me. And I think that that's something when we teach in person, we need to be careful that we're not too quick to fill in those blanks and give them time to think and ponder before we just try to guide them to an answer there. Because I've been surprised so many times when my students will come up with principles that I hadn't thought of that still apply to that scripture and they're given that space. So that's- hundred percent. So good. Thank you for, for saying that. It's really, really. Okay. Now that we've kind of defined it, um, let's talk about two different types of principles here. Okay. There's, there's stated principles. They are, they're just stated right by the author themselves. And they usually start with like, therefore, or, thus we see, or behold, the Book of Mormon has the most stated principles where the you know Mormon himself is saying, and here's what you should be getting if you're not getting it from the story, right? Um, these, these are called stated principles. There's mostly implied principles where it's not stated directly by the author, but we, we search through the storyline, the context, uh, and content, and we identify truths that are illustrated in that story or that account or what's taking place. So to do implied principles, it often requires time, right? It requires some careful consideration. That's why Joy says, don't be so quick to just tell them what they should be getting out of the story, right? It's going to take some time to dig through um, the the details. In fact, that's the way Elder Scott described it, that to separate the details of the story from the principles. So once again, testifying to what Joy has experienced as you teach, rather than simply imparting information, help the you. No, he's frozen. Yeah, I saw that. I was just going to ask if it was just me. All right. Thank you. <laughs> I was oh, wondering I was... what happened. <laughs> uh, I thought it was everybody. Yeah. I could see everyone else's head moving. So I thought, oh, you can't see now. his. <laughs> Maybe no. he's doing this time he's, to ponder. He's stuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Maybe we're supposed to find the principle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just uh, sent him a message. We'll see if that helps. Uh -huh. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, he may point. figure it out himself in a moment. <laughs> oh, he's off. Oh, yeah. He's probably so he'll back. come back on in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Leah is the is the host now, it looks like. Yeah. That's what my screen that said. <laughs> Take over. Gosh, I, wish, I wish if that was true, I could go back to the implied screen so I could snap a picture. Yeah, that'd be nice. <laughs> I know I'm not writing fast enough. Oh, good. I brought I'm, just, I'm just taking there he is. Yeah, he's back. <laughs> Sorry about that. Hello. All right. You didn't all leave. That's good. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're Is enduring to the end. <laughs> Brother Webb. Yes. Before, before you move forward, would you just go back to the implied screen just so we can snap a picture really quick and then sorry. I'd be happy to share all this with everybody. Oh, thank yeah. you. Oh, if you would, that would be wonderful. Yep. 
Yep, I will. Thank you. Okay, so here, I think this is where we, is this where you last heard me? Uh, we were at Health no. Student. You were where? Yeah. Right there? Here, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the gist of this is, this is an effort that takes some time. And so to, to quickly jump, uh, oh, here's what's going on now. Tell me what the principle is. Oh, no one's getting it. Let me just tell you. Like Joy was saying, this is it's going to take some time to help students learn this skill and for us to develop it ourselves. So here's some examples of stated principles. This is the, the entire verse that's, that's there, and the author has just said this truth to us. We don't need to read between the lines. It's just given to us, and that's what's in bold, our stated principles. Okay. Um, let's, let's do a practice with stated principles. I'm going to put three scriptures on the screen. Um, and will you just look up one of them and see if you can see the stated principle in the verse? Okay. There, there they are. Choose one of those. Um, just for practice sake, will you just type in the chat what the principle, the stated principle is that you see in the verse that you chose? It's good practice. It's true because it is stated. You could cut and paste. And there's some others who are, are going on and actually doing some implied principles in their verses. Because <laughs> And how would I know, just looking at these, which ones are implied and which ones are stated? If I was looking at this list of principles in the chat, how would I know just looking at them, which ones are implied and which ones are stated? Probably which ones are quoted. <laughs> yeah, the, the ones that are stated are the scripture words yeah. and the ones that are implied are what people have gleaned and put into their own words. Um, and that's, that's great. So stated principles are pretty, pretty easy, pretty straightforward and don't require a whole lot um, from us or from, from the students themselves. Now, implied principles are, are a little more challenging. So I'm just going to give you a couple of examples here. So in Matthew chapter 4, a teacher began to focus on the actions of the Savior and how he fasted and prayed in an effort to be with God. Then they saw how the scriptures, how the Savior dismissed the temptations and uh, that were directed at him. His fasting and prayer, the use of scriptures, provided strength to the Savior to overcome temptation. So then the principle could be, when we fast, pray, and understand the scriptures, we can have greater spiritual strength to overcome temptation. 
one way to think about implied principles is to look at cause and effect, um, right? What happened? What was the cause? And then the effect that took place because of that, that cause. A lot of teachers utilize if then statements with implied principles, which is a good block uh, structure to help someone who's trying to learn how to discover principles. Um, I hope that you won't always just do if then principles because it can get boring for students if every time you're like, okay, let's do another if then statement for the trillionth time in seminary. But it's a good, it's a good learning uh, for us. Another example of this is in 1 Nephi 18. Nephi went to the mount often to pray often the Lord. As a result, the Lord showed him great things. Principle here might be, the more I seek to commune with the Lord in personal prayer, the more he will reveal to me great things. Right? It's unpacking the story to write a statement that has uh, some sort of action involved with it like if when i do this then this this will happen um some more help here with implied principles are asking as a teacher questions like what is the moral or point of the story why do you think the author included this event or passage what did the author want us to learn from this or simply, what are some fundamental truths taught in this passage of scripture? All of those types of questions will help students pull out principles. Now, you notice that you're not even using the word principle with the students here. And that can also be a mistake done by, by teachers when they're always saying, what's the principle here? What's the principle? What's the principle? And that should be something that you say. That's totally fine. But you can say that in many different ways, right? What's okay, so I have a story that just, it cracks me up because <laughs> it's so off the beaten path with this. I have a friend, she's a master seamstress. She can sew anything. She's just amazing. And she was having trouble with the seam on a skirt and she was ripping it out and sewing it, ripping it out and sewing it. And she was going to lose the fabric. It was going to fray. And so she put it down and she flopped down in a chair and pulled open her scriptures just to take her mind off the problem. And she starts reading in the old Testament in Genesis about Adam and Eve. And she's reading that he made them close. And she has this light bulb moment that says, God knows how to sew. <laughs> and so she starts pulling out this idea that she can go to the father with anything, that he cares, that he listens. I mean, she pulls out these fundamental truths about who she is and her relationship to him. She gets down on her knees to pray about this skirt. And she has this picture come into her mind, the same way President Nelson described this heart surgery, you know, and she knows exactly what to do. And she sits down and she sews it and it's perfect. Um, but I just love that it's such a mundane illustration of that she could pull out of the scriptures her relationship with heavenly father these these truths that he's listening that she can go to him that that there's nothing that is too mundane for him that is a really cool story i love it thank you for taking the time to share that with us it's really great so the, these types of questions can help with it um, a couple of uh, quotes to wrap your minds around implied principles. B.H. Roberts said, to be known, the truth must be stated, and the clearer and more complete the statement is, the better the opportunity will the Holy Ghost Spirit have for testifying. So um, sometimes it's not real clear to students what were identified as truth. <laughs> We, we, we've talked around it. And so here's a big suggestion that I've learned over the years and I highly recommend. Write down principles in front of students. Get them on a board. Get them on somewhere in your classroom. And, and before you move on in the teaching and learning pattern to understand, fill, and apply, have it clearly stated in front of them what it is that we're understanding, filling, and applying. 
instead of just some vague conversation we just had and now we're trying to apply it but we clearly state it right get it up in front of the students elders elder scott also similarly said it's worth great effort to gather them into simple statements of principle so it can be a little tedious at times as a teacher to like clearly let's 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 clearly define exactly what we're saying here and let's get it up here on the board um somebody get i, I like to say it like this in seminary somebody somebody try to put this into one simple statement for us all this conversation that we've just had about the point of the story or what what the author is trying to teach us somebody try to put it into a simple statement and I'll write it down. And then I just write down whatever they say. And then, and then I say, okay, is this, is this what we were going for? We just had a conversation about the truths here. Does this capture what we're saying? And oftentimes there's an adjustment or two to that principle. Remember, Elder Scott said it's worth great effort to do it because we're going to have a conversation here about what this actually means now. And so we want it to be really clear what it is we're, we're saying. Sister Larson. Oh, letting the youth speak in their own way. We had, this was a couple of years ago, but we had gone through a, a section, a passage, and I asked them, you know, what, what does this mean to you? Or what does this teach? And one of my boys just popped up with, don't do dumb stuff. <laughs> so then we turned the lesson, okay, what's dumb stuff? And we had this whole just unplanned, spiritually guided things that were dumb when we made this whole list on the board. And what was wonderful, that young man rarely says anything, you know, but don't do dumb stuff was their way of saying keep the commandments. You know? Yeah. You remind me of the passage, oh, be wise, what more can I say? A teenager would interpret yeah. that as don't do dumb stuff. Don't do dumb stuff. Yeah. yeah. Really good. Thank you. So here's our practice with implied principles. If you'll open up in the Book of Mormon. This is probably impossible for you to see. I tried, I wanted to get it all on one slide <laughs> um, and I'll share this with everybody afterwards. But if you'll open up to Enos in the Book of Mormon and we're just going to use the first eight verses here to practice identifying implied principles. Um. So to do this well, right, we need to understand the context and content. We don't just jump in and identify principles. So as we look through these eight verses, well, let's, let's read them together. We, we've got time to do this. Let's read the first eight verses together. I'm going to prime the pump here a little bit by we're going to focus in as a class on the word wrestle. Okay. We're also going to make sure we recognize what is going into Enos's heart. It's going to say in verse three that something sank deep into his heart. We want to know what that is. And then what did Enos do about it? And let's go to that point. So um, Karen, you're unmuted still. Would you mind reading the first four verses of Enos chapter one? And we'll all consider these questions that are on the screen. Okay. Behold, it came to pass that I, Enos, knowing my father that he was a great just man for he taught me in his language also in the nurture and admonition of the lord and blessed be the name of my god for it and i will tell you of the wrestle which i had before god before i received a remission of my sins karen i'm gonna stop you right there real quick okay. and since sorry just to pick on you karen but when, you, when Enos says he wrestled with the Lord, what do you think that means? Um, struggled with. Okay. Try to get inf get uh, an understanding from. I like it. Yeah. Anyone else have words that come to their mind when they hear that? That Enos wrestled with the Lord? Well, I think of what wrestlers do. They engage. Yeah. They make contact. Okay. I thought Karen's word struggle was really good when we're struggling with something. Well, it implies something more than casual. Yeah, absolutely. 
Great. Let's let's read verse three, Sister Larson. Behold, I went to hunt beast in the forest, and the words which I had often heard my father speak concerning the eternal life and the joy of the saints sunk deep into my heart. And my soul hungered. Is <laughs> that song? And my soul hungered, and I kneeled down before my make. Oop, I'm sorry, I'm in four. Do you want me to continue that's, on? That's okay. We okay. will we will read four, but let's look at verse three for a minute. Okay. What what sunk deep into his heart? I guess the joy. Yeah. The words of his father. Father. Yeah. That eternal life. He's kind of having a Joseph Smith moment here. He's out in the woods and he's pondering on the thoughts. And, you know, Joseph's pondered on scriptures. He's pondering on the thoughts of his father here. And um, it's it's mulling around and, and it's sinking in. Really good. Let's have a new reader. Um, Marlene, would you mind reading starting in verse four? Sure. Thanks. And my soul hungered, and I kneeled down before my maker, and I cried unto him mightily in mighty prayer and supplication for my own soul. And all the day long did I cry unto him, yea, and when the night came, I did still raise my voice high that it reached the heavens. And there came a voice unto me saying, Enos, thy sins are forgiven thee, and thou shalt be blessed. All right, just to make sure we're on the same page, Marlene, what, what's happening here? Well, Enos was so moved by what sunk deep into his heart that he wanted more. And he kneeled down and he started praying and he prayed all day and all night. Thank you. So it says prayer and supplication. What's yeah. Uh, what is supplication? I think of it as begging, pleading. Yeah, the dictionary definition actually says begging. <laughs> okay. Right. Perfect. Earnestly or humbly. Well, and prayer, at least the way we understand it, Im implies addressing deity, um, expressing gratitude and doing it in Christ's name. But so they're putting emphasis on the pleading part when we ask for things that we need. Thank you. Really, really good. All right. We want to read five to eight. Now I'm going to ask everybody to read this. We, we read five, I think, right? Yeah. Um, but read five and eight to yourself. And what's going to happen here is there's a dialogue between the Lord and Enos in these verses. And would you just... Try to see what the dialogue is as you read five to eight to yourself. Okay. Now, we want to practice identifying implied principles here. There's four questions on the screen that might help you uh, identify implied principles. They're the same questions that we asked earlier, right? What's, what are we supposed to take from this? What can we learn from this? Those sorts of things. I want you to practice writing down a principle, actually typing it out, um, from verses one through eight. Remember the, the, the idea of keeping it simple, right? Of not writing a paragraph here, <laughs> but in a, in a statement of truth, you can have a comma or an and if you need to, but uh, write a sentence that is a, the, a truth that you glean out of these eight verses. And we'll just take a minute if you'll type that out.
There's lots of answers here. There's no, no right or wrong way to do this. If you're still typing one, please, please continue. Um, can we give each other some feedback for a minute? Uh, since this is a practice, right? This is like if we're at a basketball practice and we're coaching each other. We're going to say, hey, if you, if you put your elbow in just a little bit on your shot, you're going to have a little better. We're giving some feedback here on some principles. Um, what, what do you like about some of the principles that you see in there? Let's start with those and feel free to talk, choose someone else's and say, Hey, I really like, I really like this because. I think someone says something about not being afraid to ask questions and feeling safe. I like that. It's a feeling of safety. Yeah. The principle was. Um, a sister green wrote, he had the courage to ask how that means he felt safe. Yeah. I, I'd like a little more out of it as far as like getting a principle on a board that we could understand, fill and apply. But I, I think that's a, a really interesting idea to develop. Mm -hmm. I think Julia's looks like um, a textbook like that. That's a great, um, she says, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ makes the atonement effective in our lives, cleansing us from the eternal effects of sin. And that is almost accompanied by a choir. It's like, oh, that's it for me. <laughs> now, now think about this, friends. Like if that principle is on the board, uh, particularly if a student came up with it, <laughs> if that principle is on the board, there's a lot of conversation to be had now about understanding this. And I might ask questions about um, what the word effective means to my students. Uh, I might talk about what cleansing looks like in a teenager's life. I might talk about some eternal effects of sin <laughs> versus the cleansing power of the atonement, right? There is so much mileage that can be had from a really solid principle that is in front of students. Great. Anything, anything else that you're seeing that you, that you like? I love that God does not lie because I think that that is a truth that our youth need to have in their life and need to understand. Why? Because once they've established trust with our Heavenly Father, then they can believe his, the doctrine. But until they have trust that he's really telling them the truth, then there's no 
they're, they're slow to take action. Beautiful. So um, this is a really good example. God does not lie as a doctrine. The, mm-hmm. What you just said is a principle. Mm-hmm. Um, what you said gives action to a student's life. Right. And we want both for sure. Mm-hmm. But that's a really, that was a really good example you just gave, Sister Atkinson. I think going from what Sister Atkinson just said, Enos knew that God could not lie. And he says, wherefore my guilt was swept away. But then, so what that says to me is he believed in God when he went out to hunt that day. But had he had an experience up to that point where he actually believed him? Like he believed in him, but then he has this voice come into his, well, he, we don't know that yet. We don't know that the voice, uh, it just says a voice came to him. We don't know how. We don't know if he felt it in his heart. We don't know yet how Enos receives his own form of personal inspiration and revelation, right? Because he doesn't tell us till verse 10. Right. But he believed in God and he believed and knew that God could not lie. So then when that voice came into his head, he was, he was at that moment saying, okay, I'm going to believe him. And if I believe him and I know me and I know all about me, how in the world could it be? How does it happen? That's really good. You know, you know I think in, in modern days here, we have Pro- President Nelson to bring this forward, saying, let God prevail. In the same way that Enos is saying God could not lie. And my mother made a comment last last week that just hit me. And she said, it's safe to let God prevail. Mm -hmm. So that does have an underlying predicate that God does not lie. I think for the youth, youth knowing that God does not lie, they're being lied to all the time by friends, by TV, by media, by wherever they're at. Yeah. And knowing that God does not lie, then they feel that safe and confidence to stay on that path because they can trust him amongst everything else that's around them. Beautiful. An hour goes by fast. Um, <laughs> there's so much, so much for us to all learn. That's one thing I love about teaching is it's, it's not a skill set that's like achieved. <laughs> it's, it's a, it's an art much more than it is anything else, right? We're, we're growing and looking and progressing and understanding how to identify principles takes great effort. I I want to just invite you as you do your own personal study of the scriptures that you utilize the learning pattern in your own personal study. That's these are actually, this is a, something we don't hardly ever say the teaching and learning pattern are actually outcomes to be achieved by students and teachers. They're not, like steps to be done, they're, they're actual outcomes we want our students to possess. So we need to possess it first before we can help someone else do it. So I just, that's my real big invitation to you is as you study the scriptures on your own in your own personal study, utilize this, understand the content and context, identify principles, understand the principles, feel the truth and importance of those principles and apply the principles. And, and that's why you could spend 30 minutes studying two or three verses of scripture in your personal study. And that's great, right? It's not about checking a box of, I got through a chapter today. It's about having an in-depth experience in the word of God, and this will help us do it. So um, seminary teaching is the best calling in the world. Uh, you get to grow so much in it. Uh, and it's sanctifying, right? With, <laughs> I'm just excited for you and hope that you um, are able to continue to, to grow through the spirit. So um, if you, I'm going to stop things, I'm going to share this PowerPoint with you uh, and any other questions that you have, but I just want to end with my testimony that um, the scriptures are powerful and that their words uh, are the words of eternal life. And they're the, they're the things that are going to, bring truth into our lives with so many lies as was just barely mentioned there is a source of truth and it is his word and i know that and i share it in the name of jesus christ amen
do you already have our emails to share I that? do not. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to put it into the chat. I can okay. share files into the chat. So we're going to see if this works. And if it doesn't work, then I'll get your emails. So let's see if I can do this. All right, it should be there. I see something to download. I think I was able to download it 